All right, welcome you guys. Today we're going to be talking about the working cell. So we've talked about the anatomy of the cell and what we can find inside the cell. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how the cell works. So we talked about the cell membrane. All cells have something, a few things in common, and one of those is a plasma membrane. So we're going to talk about the structure of the membrane, which we talked a little bit about last time, but more importantly, the function of a cellular membrane. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the energy of the cell, and that'll kind of continue um, into our next couple lectures when we talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And then we're going to also cover a little bit about enzymes. So we talked about enzymes a little bit when we were talking about different uh, molecules, and enzymes are proteins, right? So proteins um, that are going to help chemical reactions. So we're going to talk a little bit about why they're important in the cell. So let's talk a little bit more about the uh, cell membrane. So they call it the fluid mosaic model. And really the membrane structure um, is just a phospholipid bilayer. And we talked about what phospholipids were before. Hopefully you guys remember what a phospholipid is. And what happens is, is there's proteins stuck or embedded uh, within that cell membrane and they have a lot of important jobs. So a big thing about the cell membrane is that it has what's called selective permeability. That means that some things can pass easily through the membrane, um, and we call that diffusion, so we'll talk about that. And then other things have to be actively um, transported across the membrane. So they don't just uh, diffuse across, they have to be um, brought across with energy. So we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about all these different proteins uh, in the membrane and what their functions are. So I really like this image. Um, I know there's a lot going on here, but it kind of gives us a little bit of an overview of the cell membrane and what kind of proteins we can find in there. So we have two different cells here. So this one here has its cell membrane here, and we've got another cell membrane over here. And these are those phospholipids, right? So bilayer, so two layers of those phospholipids. And we have a couple of enzymes, proteins that are, and enzymes are proteins, right, all stuck here within um, the membrane. And each one of these kind of shows you what the functions of them are. So we'll go through them individually. So we're going to talk through all of these different types of proteins and what their main jobs are uh, within that cell membrane. So then we have this outside the cell, and they call that the extracellular side, and then intracellular. So you'll see those terms um, again when we talk about uh, different things passing uh, through the membrane. So let's review a little bit about those phospholipids, and hopefully you've thought back to our uh, organic molecule lecture, and phospholipids are one of our type of lipids, right? So if we remember the structure of a phospholipid, we remember that they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail, or two hydrophobic tails. So the heads are okay to touch the watery environment. So that could be the extracellular fluid outside the cell or the cytosol within the cell. So they're okay touching the water, but those hydrophobic tails want, to, want nothing to do with water. And so they're gonna turn in on each other and protect each other from that watery environment. And what this hydrophobic area does is it um, does not allow most molecules to cross this membrane. So it's like a barrier. So there are some hydrophobic molecules that are able to pass through fairly easily, um, very small hydrophobic molecules. Uh, so such as O2 or CO2. So they're able to cross just on their own 
um, but most molecules are unable to cross this phospholipid bilayer and so they need um, a helper protein a lot of the times to be able to get across. So now let's go through those membrane proteins that are stuck in our phospholipid bilayer and what are all their jobs. So the first type is called an attachment protein and essentially it attaches the cell's cytoskeleton to the outside. So remember we talked about all those um, fibers and things that are inside the cell, give the cell, uh, gives the cell structure. And essentially what happens is these attachment proteins attach themselves to those um, cytoskeleton fibers and really just helps to support the membrane. It also can coordinate um, some external and internal environment changes, um, but you don't need to worry as much about that. Their main function is really to attach themselves to the cytoskeleton, and that's why they have the name of attachment protein. So our second type of protein or membrane protein is called a receptor protein. And what these guys do is they bind specific molecules and essentially they act like a messaging system. So they're gonna relay a message through that plasma membrane to the inside of the cell. So there's gonna be some sort of um, molecule out in the external environment that's going to attach to that receptor protein, which is gonna cause kind of a, a cascading event, which will then activate another molecule inside the cell to create some sort of reaction. Okay, so that's a receptor protein. Our third type is called a transport protein. And essentially there's two different types of transport proteins. There can either be uh, channel proteins or active uh, transport proteins. And essentially it depends on whether we're using energy or not. Okay, so both of these guys are going to facilitate uh, molecules entering the cell from the outside. But the difference is the channel one, just think of it like an open tunnel, right? So the molecule is able to just easily pass through that channel protein and into the cell, okay? So it's like a bridge or a tunnel over or through that plasma membrane. Whereas the, tr the active transport protein means that maybe it's going to, um, it can go either way. So bringing things in or taking things out of the cell, but essentially it's going against where that molecule wants to actually go. So we're going to have to use energy. So we're going to require some energy to essentially transport that molecule from inside the cell to outside. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about active transport in a little bit. But the thing is, is that there's two types of transport proteins one does not use energy and one does okay and that's channel versus active our fourth type of membrane protein is called a junction protein and so its whole job is to es essentially bind to another junction protein in another cell so it's like a buddy system right so it's how two cells can attach to each other through these junction proteins, okay? And we also have enzymes which are found in the membrane. So we have enzymes throughout the cell as well, but there are some that are stuck in the membrane. So these guys are gonna carry out reactions. A lot of times they'll break down molecules either as they enter the cell or within the cell itself but um, they can either be singular enzymes or they can be multiple enzymes kind of grouped together to create a sequence of reactions. So we'll talk about a very important sequence of reactions um, when we talk more about uh, cellular respiration, okay? But remember, enzymes help the cell carry out reactions. <laughs> 
Okay, so here in our picture, we have two enzymes kind of um, together, so they're grouped together and carry out a sequence of reactions. So we have our uh, initial reactant, which is our starting product. It's going to attach to the first enzyme, which will then create it or break it into a different product. And then that product will be able to attach to the next enzymes, which will then create it into a final product. Okay. So our last membrane protein is called a glycoprotein. And if you break down the word glyco meaning sugar and protein, right? So it's a sugar protein. And essentially what happens is, is it serves as an ID tag. I mean, it says, hey, I'm this type of cell, or even um, for the immune system, you're saying, hey, this is your own type of cell, don't attack me. And so it can be recognized by other uh, membrane proteins of another cell. So it's able to see that um, sugar attached to the glycoprotein and say, hey, that's a specific ID tag for that type of cell, okay? So if you want to pause the video and just kind of go back through our six membrane proteins and make sure you understand um, what each protein does, what is the function of those proteins. All right, so let's continue. I'm not going to go through them since we just did, um, but that'll be good review for you guys. So now we're going to talk about how things can um, pass through the cell membrane and whether that's going to be a passive action or an active action. So first we're going to start with our passive transport and that is diffusion across the membrane without the use of energy. So it's just easily going to diffuse across. We don't need any energy. It's just the natural way things can pass across a membrane. So the way things or the way molecules usually move is they move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So what I kind of like to think about is say you're in a really, really crowded room, right? You've got tons of people all packed together at a party. You kind of want to get out and away from all those people. So you're going to then go to the quieter area of the house, um, you know, whatever get to get away from all those people so these are molecules so they don't like to be highly packed all together so essentially they're going to want to move down their concentration gradient and that's what it's called so you're moving from a constant a high concentration of the molecule to a low concentration they like to spread out okay so these are not party goer molecules they like to be more solitary okay so what happens if we look at our um, example is if we have some molecules of dye and they're stuck on one side of this membrane, which has some holes in it, right? Some pores. They are going to want to get to the other side because there's no molecules of dye on this side. So a lot of them are going to pass through and they're going to try to even out the numbers, okay? And what happens is, yes, there's a net movement across that membrane, but then they're going to want to even out. Okay, so they kind of want the same number on each side, and they call that equilibrium. Okay, so they're going to move down their concentration gradient until they reach that equilibrium. So there's the same amount of people in each room. Okay. So there's a couple different types of diffusion or passive transport as we call it. And the first one we're going to talk about is simple diffusion. So this is through the phospholipid only. So essentially we don't need a protein of any sort to get across the membrane. We're just going straight through those phospholipids. And this is our example of our oxygen and carbon dioxide. So this is how we get oxygen into our cells and how we release carbon dioxide out of our cells. So this is what's happening in our lungs every time we breathe. So these are small nonpolar molecules. 
Okay, so when you breathe in oxygen, so say this is your um, lung air sac, right, on this side, outside the cell, and here's your red blood cell, right, on this side. So when you breathe in that oxygen, you have a higher concentration of oxygen now inside your lung, and so it's going to want to simply diffuse across that membrane and into the cell where you have a lower concentration of oxygen. And then at the same time, the CO2 now is high in your cell because you've picked it up from your tissues and you get to the lungs and that CO2 now is going to want to leave the cell because there's a lower concentration of CO2 inside your lung than inside your cell. So they're going to cross the opposite directions. Okay, so this is how we get um, oxygen and CO2 in and out of our red blood cells in our lungs and in the tissues as well. So then the opposite is going to happen once we get to the tissue. Once that red blood cell reaches where it wants to be in whatever tissue it's going to. And that's simple diffusion. So we don't need any proteins. We're just going through the membrane. So our next type of diffusion, which again is still passive, so we don't require energy, but we call it facilitated diffusion. So essentially we can't cross just the membrane itself, we need a transport protein. And we said we had a couple different types of transport proteins. So these guys are going to be the non-energy just channel transport proteins. And what happens is the molecules are still going to move from higher concent concentration to lower concentration. So they are maybe hydrophilic molecules and they can't go through that um, phospholipid bilayer. Okay, only those small nonpolar molecules can go through. Okay. So that's facilitated diffusion. We need a protein, but we still don't need energy because we're just running down our concentration gradient. So our last kind of diffusion has to do with water. So instead of talking about molecules, we're talking about water passing over a membrane. And that's called osmosis. And that's the diffusion of water across a membrane. And it's going to do the exact opposite of what the molecules are going to do. So they're going to want to go from a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. So they want to dilute out that high solute concentration. So think of salt water, okay? So salt water has a lot of salt in it, right? Whereas fresh water. And if you mix the two, the regular water is going to want to get into and dilute out that salt water. So you can think of it either way in terms of the molecule, what the molecule is doing, or what the water is doing. And they're going to be doing the opposite things. Okay, the molecules want to go from high concentration to low concentration. The water wants to go from low concentration to high concentration. Okay. So if we look at our example here, here's our selective permeable membrane. And what happens is, is we have um, a lot of um, solutes over here. Okay, so we have lots of solutes and we have a lot of water molecules everywhere. Okay, so the water molecules are going to want to move from the high um, water content or low solute concentration because we only have one of them over here and we have three of them over here. So now we want to move all those little water molecules over into the higher solute concentration over here because um, those water molecules can um, cluster around the solutes to help dissolve them. Okay, so they want to help dilute the water or dilute the um, solution, okay, and decrease that um, solute concentration. Hopefully that makes sense, okay. So just think osmosis is doing the opposite, okay. But again, you can think of it in the water molecule, right? So there's a lot more water molecules on this side than on this side. So they're moving from high water concentration to a lower water concentration. 
but so you can talk about it either in terms of water or in terms of solute okay So now that we know what uh, molecules do, so the molecules are going to move from high concentration of molecules to low concentration of molecules or down the concentration gradient. And osmosis is going to go from a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. So now we know what each of those are doing, we can talk about how this can affect a cell. So when we're talking about a cell and solutions, we're talking about tonicity. So tonicity describes the ability of a surrounding solution. So whether that cell is in water, salt water, whatever type of solution that cell is in, what does what what happens to the cell in terms of gaining or losing water? Okay. So how does that surrounding solution cause a cell to either swell with water or lose water and shrivel up? So if you think about uh, fish, let's talk about fish, okay? So if we say that, okay, so saltwater fish versus freshwater fish, right? So saltwater fish are living in a high solute uh, concentration environment right so what they have to do is they have to actually drink a lot of water to compensate the loss of water to their high solute concentration environment and so their environment we call hypertonic and we're gonna go through all of this but just to, to kind of give you a, a real-world example Okay. So saltwater fish live in a hypertonic surrounding. So essentially the water inside of their cells, inside the fish, want to leave the fish. And that would cause them to become dehydrated. So they have to drink a lot of water to compensate for that. And vice versa, if you're talking about freshwater fish, their environment is a lower concentration of solute than inside their body. Their body actually has a higher concentration. So what happens is the water from outside the fish wants to actually go inside the fish. So you wouldn't want the fish to explode. So essentially they're going to urinate frequently to compensate for the gain of water from their hypotonic surrounding. Okay. So let's go through that um, all written out for you guys, okay? But just kind of always think of fish it will help you kind of um, remember about tonicity. So there's three types of tonicity, okay? So we can have a hypotonic solution, an isotonic solution, or a hypertonic solution. Okay, so again, the tonicity describes the ability of a surrounding solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. Okay, so let's go through our three examples. So this would be an animal cell. So this would be an example like our fish. Okay, so if we have our fish um, in a hypotonic solution, that would be our freshwater fish. Okay, so there's lower solute levels in the surrounding solution than inside the cell. So the water via osmosis wants to actually rush inside that cell or inside the fish and poof, you get a lysed cell. Essentially lysed just means it explodes. Okay. Now of course a fish we don't want to explode so they're going to have to urinate a lot to actually compensate for that rushing of water into the cells. Now an isotonic solution that means that the solute levels are equal inside and outside the cell and that would be the ideal situation because then we're neither shrinking or blowing up the cell. Now if we're in a hypertonic solution Okay, that's higher solute concentrations outside the cell or outside the fish, right? And what happens is the water inside the cell wants to leave, right, via osmosis again. So that water wants to go to the higher concentrations to help dilute out that solution. And then that cell shrivels up. 
right, dehydrates. So this is our saltwater fish example, okay? So we can do the same thing, but with a plant cell. So whereas animal cells, if you put it in either too hypotonic of a solution or hypertonic of a solution, you're gonna either burst the cell or shrivel up the cell. Well, what does a plant cell have that an animal cell doesn't that might help? That's right, a cell wall. So this cell wall is very important for maintaining the integrity of the cell. So they are able to compensate much better for these different surrounding solutions. So even though they're in a hypotonic solution and the water is going into the cell, that cell wall is gonna keep it from exploding, essentially from lysine. And then conversely, in a hypertonic solution where the water wants to leave and the cell shrivels up, it has the plasma membrane that'll kind of shrivel away from the cell wall, but the cell wall maintain the integrity of the cell so it doesn't shrivel up all the way. Okay, so that's kind of another difference between plant cells and animal cells. So let's review. So you can go ahead and pause the video and circle the correct answers about tonicity and osmosis in, this, um, in these two different statements. Okay, so go ahead and pause it and we'll go through the answers. Okay, so hopefully you were able to come up with your own answers, but let's go through it. So if a cell is placed in salt water, okay, the inside of the cell is what? Hypertonic or hypotonic? While the outside of the cell or the environment is hypertonic or hypotonic. So it's talking about it in relation to each other. So the cell in this case is gonna be hypotonic, right? Less solutes inside the cell because we're in salt water. So that means the environment is gonna be hypertonic, okay? Now, when we talk about osmosis, so through osmosis, water is moving from in or out side of the cell to in or outside of the cell. Okay, so we're talking about this salt water example. Okay, so if we're if the cell is in salt water, the water is going to want to move from inside the cell to outside the cell. Okay, so it's more hypertonic outside, so there's more solutes outside, so the water wants to come move from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. Okay, just a little bit, I know it can be a little confusing there, but um, when you break it down, and remember you're in salt water, so you're in a hypertonic solution, then you can figure out where the water is moving, okay? So now let's talk about active transport. So we've just been talking about passive transport where we don't require any energy because those molecules are running down their concentration gradient, which is natural for them. Whereas active transport is gonna require energy because our molecules are gonna move against its concentration gradient meaning it's gonna go from low concentration to high concentration, and that requires energy. So we need energy, and we also need some membrane-bound proteins. So they're not gonna to want to go in back into that crowded room. So they're gonna to have to require energy to be able to move them. So what happens is we have our transport, our active transport protein here, we have our solute inside the cell, okay? And it's gonna bind our protein, but we're gonna have to use energy to push 
that molecule outside against its concentration gradient. So if we see there's four pro little molecules out here and three in here. So they're going to a higher concentration area that they don't want to go to. So essentially we require that energy to push those molecules out against its concentration gradient. So another form of active transport is how we get large molecules in and out of the cell. And that's called exocytosis and endocytosis. So this is the movement of large molecules either in or out of the cell. And so let's talk about endocytosis first. So endo is gonna be entering the cell. So how do we get things into the cell? And then exocytosis is how we exit the cell. So if I underlined what kind of helps us to remember which is which, so EN for enter the cell in endocytosis, and then EX for exit the cell in exocytosis. So these images I have down here are for endocytosis first. So why would we need to get larger molecules inside the cell? Well, they may have to eat. So cells are gonna have to eat. So maybe there's a food particle outside the cell and we wanna eat it. So essentially what happens is that cell membrane essentially engulfs that food particle and creates a food vacuole. Okay, or maybe we have some sort of molecule outside that is going to bind a receptor and then that part of the cell membrane with the receptors and the bound molecules are going to engulf the same way or invaginate is another word for it to create this vesicle. Okay, with our molecules that we bound to those receptors. So these are both ways of getting larger molecules into the cell, and that's endocytosis, okay? So now if we look at exocytosis, we're exiting the cell. So maybe we have a vesicle here with waste products or something that we don't want inside the cell. And so that vesicle is gonna bind to that cell membrane because usually the vesicles are made out of a phospholipid bi bilayer. So they're just gonna join in to that cell membrane and then just expel the contents out into that extracellular space, okay? So that's exocytosis. So both of these require energy. So they are considered active transports, okay? For these large molecules. So let's take a pause and do a little review. So what are the types of active transport versus passive transport? Okay, so name and describe our three types of passive transport first, and then name and describe our three types of active transport that require energy. So hopefully you were able to pause the video. So our three types of passive transport are going to be simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. So what are the differences between the three of those? So simple are going to be our small nonpolar compounds. Okay, so they can just simply diffuse across the membrane. Whereas facilitated diffusion needs a transport protein, even though we don't need energy, it's just gonna be a channel protein. And then osmosis has to do with water moving across the membrane, okay? And then our three types of active transport, okay? Or transports that require energy, because our first one is active transport where we have a transport molecule, but we're going against the concentration gradient. So we need energy to push those molecules out. And then we have our endocytosis, bringing things into the cell or entering the cell. And we have exocytosis where we're 
exiting the cell or sending things out of the cell, okay? So now that we know more about the cell membrane and how things get in and out of the cell and kind of active versus passive transports, let's talk a little bit about energy. So we're talking about the cell as kind of a powerhouse. It's a, it's a working cell. If you think of it kind of like a motor, right? So we'll talk a little bit about what kind of um, work the cell does. So essentially energy is the capacity to do work, right? So the cell has the capacity to do work and that's energy, right? So we need energy. So there's two different types of general energy and we talk about kinetic energy versus potential energy. So kinetic, think movement, okay? And then potential energy, think stored energy. So it has the potential to do work, okay? And kinetic energy is the movement, is the work itself. So for example, um, some kinetic energies would be thermal energy, so heat, right? Uh, large objects have kinetic energy and light, okay? Potential energy, some examples would be a battery, okay? Or chemical energy, okay? So if we look at kind of our pictures down here to explain a little bit more, if we're talking about potential energy, that might be an inflated balloon. So it has stored energy here because it has the capability of doing work. But if we open up that balloon and that air rushes out and the balloon moves, that's kinetic energy, okay? So same thing with our bicycle in action here. You need kinetic energy to get up a hill, right? You're moving up the hill. But once you're stopped at the top of the hill, you have potential energy, okay? Because then that's gonna come out as kinetic energy when you go down the hill, okay? So think movement for kinetic energy and think stored for potential energy. So let's go through the laws of thermodynamics. So I know this is getting a little outside the realm of you know, what we might think of as biology, but essentially it's very important um, when we're talking about energy to talk a little bit about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So the first law is about the quantity of energy. So how much energy is there? While the second law is about the quality of that energy, right? So how much punch does that energy actually contain, right? How much, there, how, like how good is that energy, okay? So our first law states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but it can be transferred, okay? So that's the key there. It can be transferred. So essentially a lot of things that our body does and a lot of machines do is they transfer energy, okay? So if we take our, um, a, just a classic machine model, right? Energy conversion in a car. So essentially we're gonna take our fuel, right? Our acting, you know, maybe potential energy objects gasoline and oxygen, you put them in the car, it undergoes a combustion reaction, which is then your kinetic energy of movement, but essentially you're transferring that energy into heat, okay? So that's heat energy. And then you have some waste products, right? So you're, con you're transforming fuel into waste, okay? So this is essentially what our body does also, okay? So we're going to use energy or fuel to create energy, right? Movement, kinetic energy in the body. We're gonna give off heat and we're gonna create waste products, okay? Carbon dioxide and water. And similarly, we're creating the same waste products, okay?
So the second law is going to be more about the quality of that energy. So when you transfer energy in the first law, right, we can't create it or destroy it. But as we transfer it, you're going to lose the usefulness of it and increase entropy or increase disorder. So what does that mean? That means that when you're using this energy here, this fuel, and you're going to turn it into heat and movement, if you were to create, you're going to lose some power in that energy. So that heat that it gives off, if you were to use that heat to try to power something else, it's definitely not going to be as much um, a fit, as, as efficient as our original fuel or, or as our original energy. So essentially you're going to lose some of that usefulness in that energy and it's going to increase entropy or disorder. And heat, you know, if you think about heat and the movement of molecules, it's going to increase the disorder of the molecules. They're going to be higher energy, okay? So let's look at this in the form of our cells. Okay, so what's happening actually in our cells? Say instead of a car, we're talking about a cell. So here's our cell, right? So instead of gasoline and oxygen, we're gonna use our fuel, which is glucose, which is sugar. So we use sugar and oxygen as our starting energy, and we're gonna transfer that energy into ATP. And we do that in our cells via cellular respiration. So cellular respiration, we're gonna go through in greater detail, but essentially it's like it's not a combustion reaction like in a car but essentially we're transferring that energy from the glucose into another form of energy which is ATP and then that ATP is able to then power uh, different uh, reactions in the cell okay and then we're going to lose some of that heat as energy as well okay and that's where we lose some of that quality of that energy um, as heat. And then again, we're going to have the same waste products as we do with a machine or a combustion reaction is we're going to get carbon dioxide and water. Okay? So our body will have to get rid of the carbon dioxide and water. So when we're talking about the cell and energy, we're talking about chemical reactions. Okay? And there's two types of chemical reactions. One that releases energy, and that's an exergonic reaction. And then one that stores energy or requires the input of energy, and that's an endergonic reaction. Okay, so let's look at an example. So say we have our disaccharide sucrose, right? Now say we break that bond, right, between those two um, monosaccharides, what are we going to get? We're going to get glucose and fructose, right, our two monosaccharides, but what else do we get? We get energy, okay? So this is an exergonic reaction because we have now released energy, okay? So usually when we break bonds, we're going to release energy. But we also said that we can create sucrose out of glucose and fructose, right? So we can create a bond between glucose and fructose, and essentially it's the exact opposite reaction. So we add energy into the fructose and glucose reaction to create sucrose, okay? So that's taking an input of energy to create sucrose. And you can think of sucrose as then having potential energy, right? So it's fuel, right? It's going to be fuel that we would use as energy, okay? So let's do a little review so you can pause the video and go through what are our two types of energy, okay? And then what is the difference between the first and second law of, ther of the thermodynamics? And then what's the difference between an endergonic and an exergonic reaction? Okay.
Okay, so hopefully you were able to answer these questions. So what were the two types of energy we talked about? We have kinetic energy and we have potential energy. So kinetic energy is the movement, right? The releasing of energy. Whereas the potential energy is stored energy. It's what has the potential to come out, right? And then if we talk about the difference between our first and second laws of thermodynamics, the first law is all about the quantity of energy, how much energy, okay? Whereas the second law of thermodynamics has to do with the quality of that energy, right? So the first, you're transferring energy. It can neither be created nor destroyed. And then the second is the quality. As you transfer that energy, you're going to lose the usefulness. You're going to lose a little bit of energy as you transfer it. Okay. So what's the difference then between an endergonic reaction and an exergonic reaction? So an endergonic reaction stores energy. Right? So it requires the input of energy to happen, whereas an exergonic reaction releases energy. Okay. So when we talk about chemical reactions in the cell, cells are carrying out thousands of these chemical reactions, and they're going to be both exergonic and endergonic reactions, and we can even couple them together. Okay, so say we have a reactant, call it A. We have a reaction, right? Maybe we use an enzyme to help create that um, reaction or make that reaction happen faster. And then you get some products, right? So say it's product B, which then we use in another reaction, which requires another enzyme. And you kind of get where we're going, right? Which then we get another product, which then goes through another reaction with another enzyme, and then you get a final product, right? So you go through a bunch of reactions or chains of reactions in the cell, and that's happening all the time, okay? And so when you put all of these chemical reactions together in an organism, right, in a living being like us, it's called our metabolism. Okay, so our metabolism is just composed of many, many metabolic pathways. And each of these metabolic pathways include many different reactions. Okay, so that's just kind of the, so we look at kind of the little picture, but you got to remember the big picture, right? So the accumulation of all those chemical reactions and metabolic pathways is called our metabolism. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more about the molecule that we keep calling energy or cellular energy, right? And that's ATP. So ATP is what drives cellular work by coupling reactions. And coupling reactions just means that it's part of the reaction, okay? So it's our source of cellular energy. And we keep saying ATP, ATP is energy. But what does that actually mean? What is ATP? So ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So we have an adenosine molecule, and that's attached to three phosphate molecules. Okay, so T for tri and phosphate. So essentially this is ATP is just a molecule, but what happens is, is we can break a bond between two of those phosphates to create energy. So we undergo a hydrolysis reaction. We add water to ATP and we break that bond. So then we end up with ADP, which is adenosine with two phosphates and a phosphate all on its own. But remember, whenever we break a bond, we're going to create energy, okay? And so that's how we use ATP to uh, get that cellular energy. It's a source of cellular energy, okay? So we said ATP drives cellular work by coupling to the reactions, okay?
So what are our three types of work that ATP helps us with inside the cell? The first one is chemical work. So essentially it's going to help turn reactants into products. Okay. So here's our example here. So we have some reactants. We bind ATP to one of them. Okay. And then undergo the reaction and we lose our phosphate, right? Remember we undergo high, um, a hydrolysis reaction and then we lose that phosphate to gain energy. And that energy is then input into the, the bond that's formed between those two reactants to create a product, okay? And so that's how that ATP molecule is working for us and we utilize the energy from that breaking of the phosphate bond and put that energy or that work into forming a product. Okay, so then you end up with that ADP and phosphate because we've broken that bond to use that energy in this reaction. Okay. So our other type of work that we use ATP for is transport work. So remember we have those transport molecules that we call active transport molecules because they require energy. Well, that energy comes from the ATP. So we bind that ATP molecule to the transport protein, okay? And then we undergo hydrolysis and break that phosphate off, which then transfers that energy into the protein, the transport protein, which then pushes that molecule out, okay? So we're utilizing that energy from the ATP into that transport protein. And again, you get your same ADP plus phosphate products, okay? Now our last type of work that we'll talk about in the cell is mechanical work. So we actually can move motor proteins in the cell. For example, muscle cells. So muscle cells are a great example of mechanical work, okay? So we have two um, muscle filaments here, okay? Actin and myosin filaments. And essentially there's this little motor head, motor protein that comes down from one of the filaments and attaches to the other filament. And essentially we attach ATP there. Okay. We undergo the reaction to cleave or break that phosphate off and essentially it gives energy to that little motor protein and it pushes the other filament that way and propels this um, filament that way. And essentially it's how we shorten our muscle cells, therefore shortening the entire muscle. Okay, And you get muscle contraction. Okay, so that's how our muscle cells work at a very um, small, um, you know, microscopic level, right? And obviously there's so many of these motor proteins along these um, muscle filaments within the muscle cell. Okay. So now that we know how we utilize ATP as energy for these different chemical reactions and this um, work inside the cells, let's talk a little bit about how enzymes can help these chemical reactions because they actually act as biological catalysts. So essentially they speed up the rate of reactions. So they don't create reactions, they essentially just speed them up and help them along. Because if you think about how many of those reactions are happening in the cell, they have so many reactions going on and you need them to be happening at a just unbelievable rate. So that's where enzymes come into play. And we've talked a little bit more about enzymes or we've talked about enzymes, but now we're gonna really get into the crux about why they're important and how they work in terms of chemical reactions and energy. So when we look at an enzyme, so here's our big purple enzyme down here, which is a protein, it's always gonna have this active site, okay? And that active site is going to bind a substrate. And the substrate is the reactant in the reaction, 
okay? So it's the reactant that we're gonna turn into a product. So it attaches to that active site, okay? And what happens is, is it decreases the um, amount of energy required for that reaction. So now that we know that we have reactions in the body that require energy, right, it requires ATP, well, having an enzyme is actually going to decrease how much energy is required for that reaction. And that's great, right? If you're saving energy, you can put that energy toward other things in the body. And so then that enzyme converts uh, that substrate into a product. Okay, so that's the basics of how enzymes work. So if we look at an example of an enzyme, okay, so here's our big purple enzyme, let's call it sucrase. So a big hint here, most enzymes end in ASE or ACE, okay. So it has an active site ready to bind a molecule and that molecule or that substrate is sucrose. Okay, so the sucrose binds that sucrase right in that active site. We add water, okay, and essentially the enzyme breaks that bond, requiring less energy than it would have needed before. And then you get your products, your fructose and glucose, okay. So essentially it's helping an already, you know, created reaction because this reaction could happen without the enzyme but essentially it decreases the energy required to um, undergo that reaction okay and it speeds it up right if you don't require as much energy it'll go faster so another few things about enzymes is that we actually have some coenzymes as well. So they're like little helper enzymes that help uh, the main enzyme carry out the reaction. And many vitamins are coenzymes or help make coenzymes in our body. So that's why vitamins can be uh, very important uh, for us. And most vitamins we get in our food, but a lot of people take supplemental vitamins as well. So another thing about enzymes is that we can actually inhibit the enzymes to regulate the activity. So, you know, enzymes just kind of keep going, right? They plug along, they're breaking bonds, they're doing that. But sometimes we don't want them to break that bond, right? Maybe say our example of sucrase enzyme, right? That breaks sucrose. Say we live, hey, we've got enough glucose and fructose in the body, we don't need any more, let's slow down that enzyme. So you can either slow it down or stop it altogether by using some of these inhibitor um, products. So we have two different types of inhibitors. And one is a competitive inhibitor, which is going to compete directly with the substrate to bind to that active site. So if the competitive inhibitor binds first, then it, it doesn't allow the substrate to bind. So that could slow down the enzyme, right? So if we have that mixed in with the, with the substrate, then it's not always gonna bind because maybe that competitive inhibitor will bind instead. And then we have a non-competitive inhibitor, which is gonna bind elsewhere on the enzyme and then it's going to change the, the makeup of the active site so that the substrate can no longer bind. So if we look at our two examples down here, we have our competitive inhibitor here. So it looks kind of similar to the substrate because it's going to bind that active site instead of the substrate. And then we have a non-competitive inhibitor, which is going to bind somewhere else on the enzyme but it changes the shape of that active site so that that substrate can no longer bind, okay? And a great example of a non-competitive inhibitor is ibuprofen, um, which is an NSAID, right? So what ibuprofen does is it actually is a, a non-competitive inhibitor of an enzyme in our body called cyclooxygenase, or COX for short.
And what it does is it binds this cyclooxygenase um, enzyme, which is required for our inflammatory pathway, and therefore the substrate can no longer bind and it slows down that inflammatory pathway. So that's what um, you know, ibuprofen, a lot of these NSAIDs are. And that's what NSAID stands for is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So it's an anti-inflammatory drug and that's how it does that is it binds one of the enzymes in the inflammatory pathway and turns it off essentially, okay? So now that we know that our enzymes can be blocked or inhibited, another way we can do that is by feedback inhibition. So we have those inhibitor products that are going to compete with the substrate or block the binding of the substrate. But say so we, we produce a product um, more than what is needed, right? So then that product itself is actually going to act as an inhibitor. So instead of another compound, um, such as a competitive or non-competitive inhibitor, we actually use the product of the chemical reaction itself as an inhibitor. So this is very common in um, our hormone pathways, okay, in our endocrine system of the body. So essentially we have our, you know, chain of reactions and then we finally get this product and we say, hey, we've got enough product D, we don't need any more. And that product D is actually going to feed back and block one of the enzymes earlier up in the chain of the reaction and be um, an inhibitor compound. Okay, So it's either going to uh, block the binding of that protein or enzyme or something like that. So it slows it down or blocks it completely when we have enough of that product, okay? So that's called negative feedback, essentially, negative feedback inhibition. So let's review, right? So go ahead and stop the video and just explain in your own words how an enzyme speeds up a reaction, okay? So hopefully you were able to pause the video and just kind of explain how enzymes speed up reactions. So I have a little graph here that kind of shows you a little bit about this activation energy. So if we have the energy of the reactants, right, and you're going to create these products, well, you're going to have to have a spike in energy to create the products, okay? And if we have, so the red line is the energy required without an enzyme for this reaction. Okay, so that's the activation energy required without an enzyme. So if we add an enzyme into the reaction, we're gonna lower that activation energy requirement. So less energy is needed to create the same products in that reaction, okay? So it essentially, lowers the activation energy requirement of the reaction. Okay, so that's what it does, is it lowers that energy requirement. All right, well, this is the end of this lecture. So hopefully you guys learned a little bit more about energy today, and then we'll talk a lot more about uh, cellular respiration and photosynthesis in the upcoming lectures. And I hope to see you guys in office hours next week. Have a good weekend.